você, eu posso ficar lá andando porque aqui é Pode, centro. Então, você... Quando começamos, né? Não é. Então, mas você só. Então, Another is a, a tweet by um, President Bolsonaro, which is arguing that, uh, well, the phrase is to, uh, to remove the Marxist trash that has been installed in the institutions of teaching, right? This is an anti-ideological uh, uh, vision of education, where teaching is a neutral task which should be removed of political content, right? So the view of how politics works in the classroom varies hugely in society and in political debate. But in terms of research and political study, we actually know very little about the key people who influence education, teachers. What is it that de de determines who is in that classroom, what they are teaching, and how they behave, how they impart knowledge and values and ideas into, into students? And so this study is really trying to um, address a little bit of a gap in our understanding of the politics of the classroom. Okay. Throughout this presentation, we're going to make two key distinctions. One is who becomes a teacher? What is the recruitment, the selection process by which um, some people enter into the classroom and others take other jobs in different parts of the economy? There are two parts to that even. There's a self-selection process, right? You have to be willing and apply to become a teacher, and then you have to be accepted and selected as a teacher. Yeah? If both of those things happen, hopefully you, you are able to actually teach. But these are full of subtle and complex influences, right? Socioeconomic and political factors which drive people's choice to enter the teaching profession and their acceptance into that profession. So if we want to understand what teachers' political attitudes, preferences over education policy, their political participation is, we have to understand who is coming into the classroom. Right? But more than that, we also need to understand how being in the job changes the teacher themselves. There's a socialization consequence of being a teacher. Many different things happen, okay? Once you're given that, that contract and you start to receive your monthly salary as a permanent teacher, maybe your income goes up, um, maybe you have to move your location, right, to start your job, um, maybe you start to interact with new colleagues with different political ideas from you. You start to interact with students who are from a different social group. There are many socialization processes um, that affect you. You're now engaging in a very different way with the school system, with the organization that employs you, with the state as a whole, right? Before you may have been a private citizen, a temporary teacher, someone working in the informal sector. Well, now you're a part of the state if you're a public teacher, right? You are now part of the, um, the governing apparatus. That may change your perspective and your views on many different topics, political topics. Th the focus of this study, as I've already hinted, <laughs> is going to be both, both quite complex and quite specific. Um, we're particularly interested in one category of teachers, those who have permanent public sector jobs, right? This is public sector teachers who have a permanent contract, okay? There are various points of contrast and comparison we can make there, right? One is with non-teachers, people who work in other professions. One is private sector versus public sector. One is temporary versus permanent teachers, yeah? Those are comparisons that we want to make in the future, but I'll only be able to hint at today. But throughout this discussion, when I'm talking about teachers, I'm talking about primary, secondary school teachers who are permanent public school um, teachers. And there are a range of theories for why we might think that being in the public sector um, uh, changes your behavior, but there's also theories of that selection process. So let's deal with the selection first. Why would it be that different types of people end up being teachers? Well, there's a lot of literature here coming from very different perspectives, but the main emphasis of that literature is that teachers tend to have a more pro-social behavior, right? Their motivation for doing teaching is that they are um, wanting to invest back into society to um, provide some um, preparation for the next generation, and in particular that they are, for example, more averse to corruption, right? The people who choose to do a public sector job, whether because it has lower income than the private sector, 
um, or, or because it's a, uh, a contribution to society, may be more willing to sacrifice in order to take that position. The counterpart of that, for which we also have evidence, is that generally speaking, people who join the public sector have less intrinsic sort of salary motivation, right? They're motivated more by the extrinsic impact that they can have on society, by their contribution, right? By the ideas of the profession rather than by the money itself, yeah? And another strand of the literature also focuses on um, the people who become teachers being more risk averse. Yeah. Uh, the private sector may pay you better, but it doesn't guarantee you a job and tenure for the next 10, 20 years of your life. Public sector employment tends to have a trade-off, right? Higher uh, job stability for maybe a lower salary. Yeah. So people who have more risk aversion or more conservative in taking risks tend to join the public sector according to the existing literature. For our study, we've tried to sort of develop from this a few hypotheses of how we think um, teachers are likely to be selected into the profession within Brazil. Um, first, not surprisingly, we expect them to be more educated. That's just a requirement, right? If you're passing the concursos and the exams that you need to become a teacher, you need to be more educated in order to be selected. So one key factor here is being more educated. The second building on this existing literature is that we expect the, the teachers being selected into the classroom to be more supportive of redistribution. Based on these pro-social motivations, based on the tendency to trade off salary for intrinsic motivation, many of the a political attitudes that we expect of teachers are uh, more in favor of pro-social investments, for example, through redistribution. And finally, precisely because teachers are more extrinsically motivated, we expect them to be more politically active. They're more likely and more willing to have an impact on society. And so they should be more active in political discussion, in political, in voting, for example, in signing petitions, in attending meetings, uh, joining political parties. So we have some specific hypotheses that we expect will shape the cohort of people who come into the classroom. And hopefully I'm going to show you some evidence on whether these things are true um, later in the talk. But I also want to look at how the job, being a teacher, changes you, changes your political attitudes. And when we first started discussing this, my reaction from personal experience was that the main effect is you have less sleep. Right? They wouldn't allow me to test that, unfortunately. Apparently, it's unethical, um, <laughs> unreasonable to ask these questions. So we thought of some other factors. Right? So we looked in the literature. How does becoming a public sector permanent teacher change your experience, your political attitudes, and your participation in politics? Well, the first set of theories that we have is sort of a classic interest group argument. Once you are an insider within the bureaucracy, once you are a um, permanent public sector teacher, you're protected, right? You have an interest in maintaining and securing your job. You can use collective action to advance your own interests, right? We often complain about bureaucrats working for themselves to raise their own salaries. And often this is taken at a macro level to actually increase the size of the state. What are all those bureaucrats doing? They're just making the state bigger so they can benefit more and more and employ more and more people that are their friends. And so there's this interest group logic that teachers are likely to work for their own interests and expand the size of the state. Other theory focuses on what's called the double motive hypothesis, right? That, well, teachers are citizens too. They consume other public policies like healthcare, infrastructure, and so they have just as much reason to vote and participate in politics as the rest of us. But they're also producers of that policy. Right? So they have an interest as the producer in the office writing the memos and organizing the policy as well. And so they also have an additional reason to vote, to influence their own working conditions. So not only may they have a biased interest, but they'll work harder to advance that interest. Right? Because unlike the rest of the population, uh, who when they vote doesn't affect their own working conditions. Third, there's a, a sort of growing literature on, on how um, teachers are co-opted by political parties. 
focusing on very salient cases like Mexico, for example, um, when teachers have that implementation of policy influence and respect and influence in society, political parties often try and co-opt them into their party um, structures in order to benefit from their status, from their influence, uh, both in society at large and in the policy implementation. The organizational literature on the bureaucracy also suggests that quite complex things can happen when you join these organizations with their own culture and norms. Right? You get socialized into a new um, set of working practices and expectations. A classic example of this is, is Kaufman's book on the forest ranger in the US. The forest ranger is sort of this lone guy who goes for hundreds of miles into the forest, putting out fires and saving everything, right? There's no one watching and supervising the forest ranger. There's no one motivating or incentivizing them. They do that because of an intrinsic motivation that comes from the organization's goals and the organization's culture. Similarly with teaching, people sacrifice and they do specific kinds of tasks because they are in a teaching profession where the organization and their colleagues value certain behaviors, right? Transparency, openness, honesty, supporting students. People go beyond, not because of um, supervision or incentives, but because of the organization's norms. Finally, and perhaps you know, most simply, joining an organization like the teaching profession can change your income. It can change your socioeconomic situation whether it's the level of your income or it's a stability. And often with teaching, we expect more secure incomes, right? And that, that may affect your political preferences and your ability to participate in politics. People with more resources both have different interests over taxation policy, for example, and also more resources with which to participate in politics. So there's lots of ways in which the literature suggests that teachers' um, experiences might be changed by their their work in the, in the state. We tried to filter those down to some specific hypotheses for the Brazilian case which we could test. And the first was that we expected um, becoming a teacher to basically put you more in the middle class, sort of a, a becoming more in the bourgeoisie, right? You've elevated yourself to the status of a public servant. You've got a permanent job now, which presumably in the long run will pay you more, is more stable, is a higher income, raises your income expectations. Maybe now you can invest in a home, right? Because you have certainty over your long run career. And what does the literature tell us? The literature tells us that when all of those things happen, right? People tend to become more conservative. Higher income, higher income stability, more home ownership are all associated with more conservative right wing attitudes. And so this is an effect that we expect will actually counteract the selection effect I described earlier. So if the teaching profession is attracting people who are broadly from the left, once they join, the hypothesis here is that the stability of income they get actually may push them more to the right, yeah, counteracting that effect a little. Another set of hypotheses we want to focus on, building on that literature, is what I would term a sort of empowerment effect that once you become a you know, permanent public school teacher, you have more security in your job and your life with which to express your true political preferences. If someone doesn't agree with you or something, that's okay. I have my job, I'm secure. I don't need to hide my true feelings now. I don't need to pretend that I'm in the majority. Yeah, I can be more secure. I also have, as a result of being within the state in a stable environment, more information, higher status, with which to increase my influence over politics. I have higher efficacy, more ability to influence the way that politics works once I have the resources provided by being a public servant. All of this together suggests that we should expect uh, even more political activism, right? We should expect more political participation from our teachers once they are socialized into the profession. They have more resources, more uh, empowerment, more status. This goes in the same way as the selection effect, right? So we're getting politically active teachers, uh, candidates for teachers who once in the job become even more politically active. We have a few other hypotheses as well, just to finish off. One is that, well, because you now have a stable job, we actually expect that you'll have a more integrated position within the community. 
right? If I, I'm a temporary teacher, for example, I might change my job once every year. In the private sector, I might move around to find the highest paid opportunities. But once I have a permanent contract with a public sector employer, well, I may as well put down roots and buy a house and stay in my community and get to know that community. I'll have my, more exposure, uh, more understanding of the needs and preferences of the community in which I teach, right? And the contrast here, I think, is with sort of temporary teachers who come in, teach, and fly out, right? Because they're just there for a year, they're just there for a short period. They have their political preferences, and they're not really affected by the context in which they teach. But when you're there for a long time, you take on some of the characteristics and the, the, the needs and preferences of the school and the community in which you're embedded. Just as we discussed in the, the sort of classic literature on being an insider, um, an, an interest group, we also expect bureaucratization, right? That these people will become bureaucrats in the sort of negative sense of the word, of having a vested interest in education policy that favors themselves rather than reformist policy. That they will have an interest in responding to, for example, the arguments of unions rather than NGOs, right? And finally, we expect some cynicism. That once you're exposed to the public sector and its operation and you see you know, how the sausage of education is made from the inside and you understand the workings of it, you have a greater appreciation of the risks and the challenges, the corruption, the uh, incompetence, and that that could potentially lower trust in state institutions. That's quite a lot, okay? So I know I've gone through quite a lot of theory and hypotheses here, um, but that was really just to sort of lay out our motivations and some of the many different political changes that we expect to happen when you become a teacher. So this is a very sort of broad brush project looking at a range of outcomes. I'm now going to make it more applied and more practical by talking about um, how this process of teacher recruitment and selection works in Brazil and how we use that to collect data and try and answer and address some of these hypotheses. So because our interest is mostly in primary and secondary education, we're mainly dealing with state and municipal governments here, right, who are the ones providing um, uh, basic education. One striking factor about Brazil, which is perhaps not as true of other countries in its level of development, is that the process is generally extremely meritocratic and transparent. Teacher selection is widely praised and ranked, ranked very high by international institutions uh, compared to other countries in the region and across the world. The rules, the expectations are published you know, in, the, in the official diary um, of the government so anyone can apply and everyone can see what opportunities there are. The deadlines, the criteria are extremely clear. Being recruited is based on a series of exams and interviews which are objectively documented and scored. And it is very impressive and very tiring to, oh no, okay, that didn't work. Um, read all the rules for the editals, the announcements for these jobs, the call for applications. Here was meant to be a document of about 30 pages documenting one of the concourses we, we study, the exams, in Alagoas. And it's really, really detailed. It takes a very long time to understand, right? And it took me many, many months to really get a grip on what was going on because every possible scenario has been thought of. And it's really quite impressive. You do not see this in many countries. Other countries are like, yeah, there's an exam, we'll pick the best person, right? Here it's like every possibility is considered. And that helps give, give confidence in the, the meritocracy, the reliability of these, these processes. All that to say that we can have confidence that actually this recruitment process, even though we're studying political attitudes, is not itself permeated by political bias. It's a relatively objective process that can lead to one of three results. The candidate can be rejected if they do not meet the minimum requirements. That could either be because they don't have the right basic, you know, they don't have um, uh, uh, working rights to be in the country, for example, or because they don't meet a minimum score. They can be qualified, that is, they meet a minimum requirement, but they do not get offered the job. Or in the best case scenario, they can be selected. They can be offered a job. They can have a high enough score on the exam, on the concourso, to be ranked high enough to get a job. 
There are many concursos across Brazil in many areas. We partnered with one organization called Sebraspi in Brasilia, which runs these concursos and organizes them, a private sector organization which manages the concursos on behalf of state governments. And we worked with them to, um, under to develop this study and to get access to data that they have on all the candidates for concursos in the primary and secondary education system in the last five years, probably more than that now, five years at the time probably seven years now. And we got data on four concursos, one in Distrito Federal in Brasilia, and the other three in, in the northeast of Brazil. Two for states, two for municipal governments. And the idea was that we would use this data to understand the profile of candidates applying to be teachers, and then study those teachers who entered the profession to see how their political attitudes changed. It became complicated quite quickly in ways I did not expect. So rather than there being, for example, a single concurso, there are lots of mini concursos. There are lots of mini exams for different parts of, or different job um, specificities. And in fact, in our data, we have over 260 different competitions that are being run to, to recruit someone. Here, for example, is the, luckily this picture worked. Um, here is the, the, the set of quotas, the number of jobs available in various categories, so for example in, uh, in biology, right, in the second grade in biology we have eight general posts available and one additional post for someone with a disability, right? In other areas we have, you know, just one job available. There are lots of these small competitions, it's not one big competition but lots of small ones and that has implications for how we, we need to analyze the data. But in total, we were able to gather data on over 78,000 teacher candidates, of which 5,500 were qualified enough to be teachers, and 1,600 positions were available to be recruited. So about a third, of the, a third or a quarter of the qualified um, uh, applicants were uh, initially eligible to get a job. And with this data, um, we were also able to see the distribution of the applicants across Brazil. Okay? The maps aren't very clear, I apologize, but it's quite spread out across the country with a huge number in Distrito Federal because that was a very big concurso and lots of people applied from there. But we have a reasonably good coverage in, uh, in Alagoas, in, in Maranhão, where we have one concurso in São Luís, and in Sergipe, where we have one concurso in São Cristóvão. With that data, we're already able to say quite a lot about the selection process, the recruitment process. How do teacher candidates compare to the broader population? And so I'm going to already jump to show you the results for this selection process, and then we'll talk more about the, the real challenging part of the socialization effects once you become a teacher. So here's the basic data, um, the distribution of teacher candidates in green, teachers in orange, and the overall population in purple. Clearly teachers and candidates are much more educated than the overall population. We took this data and all our points of reference from uh, the LAPOP um, attitudes data for the specific states in which these people were recruited. So it's a local measure, it doesn't include people from Rio Grande do Sul or something, right? And we also took data from the World Value Survey for other questions where we needed it. But it's very clear that the candidates and the teachers are at the very higher end of the education spectrum, and that just reflects the requirements for the job. We also see a huge difference in attitudes to redistribution. Teacher candidates are much more in favor of redistributive policy. Okay? We see a much higher peak at this end of the scale. Almost nobody is against redistribution, whereas the broader population has you know, nearly half of the respondents are very negative on additional redistribution. Note how similar these two distributions are between the candidates and the teachers. Most of the difference here is coming from the self-selection of the application process, not from the, 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 the concourse organization and exam selecting a subgroup of the candidates who are particularly unusual. The candidates, the teachers, the people who become teachers are very representative of the broader pool of candidates. Only that ca pool of candidates is very different to the broader population in terms of their attitudes to redistribution. 
Of course, there are many reasons for this. And one of them is the education I just showed you. More educated people in general, descriptively, tend to have higher preferences for redistribution. Nothing super scientific, but a quick regression controlling for education nevertheless suggests that there are strong effects of redistribution for candidates and teachers compared to the broader population, even after we control for education. So there may be some additional effects here as well. Yeah, so um, don't worry too much about this. It's basically us normalizing the response categories. Like, are you very much against or very much in favor? Um, the LAPOP categories, what we did is we actually took the questions, the same question that LAPOP and World Value Survey used, and we applied it as well. But in some cases, we had to make some changes for consistency. And so you see there's a couple of categories missing here. So this is really just a normalization of that distribution of possible options, like a Likert scale type response, yeah. Sorry, I should have explained that better. Um, does this preference for different types of public policy carry over to different voting, uh, reported voting patterns? Well, unfortunately, the, the election that we looked at 2018 was kind of an unusual election because Cyril Gomez was running and he was kind of the education candidate. And so actually a lot of the teachers supported him. <laughs> and so it's not a necessarily a great comparison, but we have uh, both reduced support for um, Fernando Haddad and for Bolsonaro compared to the broader population. The purple dots there are the broader population. The orange and green are the teachers and the, the candidates. So the teachers and the candidates, again, are very similar, but they're less supportive of the mainstream left and right-wing parties and more supportive of the education candidates, which is... Not especially surprising. The third thing we want to look at for these selection measures is participation, political participation. To what extent do teachers and candidates participate more than the, the broader population? Again, the comparison is with the purple dots. The purple dots are the ones that are the, um, the, the broader population. And actually, for things like civic participation, we don't see a huge difference. Right? Participation in... Um, Religious associations and neighborhood associations is not so different. Labor unions is significantly higher amongst our teacher candidates. Membership of political parties, uh, where am I, is not super different either. It's a little bit lower. Yeah. <coughs> On this side, tendencies to vote are higher amongst teachers and candidates than the broader population, and political activity across the board tends to be quite a lot higher except for participation in specific political parties, people tend not to be members of political parties if you're a teaching candidate, presumably associated with a desire to be relatively neutral and not appear biased when you're applying. But other activities like um, demonstrations, strikes, petitions, people tend to be more active if they are teaching candidates. So that hypothesis is also confirmed. Again, there's no statistical tests here. This is just the quick data that we brought out. Um, but these are statistically different um, findings on the political activity side. And so looking at the selection process then, compared to the overall population, candidates to be teachers are more educated, they're more pro-redistribution, they're more politically active, but they tend to be less active in political parties right, than the broader population. And so that confirms quite a few of the hypotheses we have. The reason I'm emphasizing these results though is because they actually provide a nice counterpoint and point of comparison to the results when we look at the effects of becoming a teacher, the socialization effect of once you enter the state. The challenge is that looking at that socialization effect is methodologically much more challenging, right? Because as we know, as those of you who've been taking courses this week know, right, understanding causality and impact of a specific treatment is subject to many risks. So what we did was we looked at our data and we looked at the people who became teachers <coughs> and we wanted to understand how being a teacher changed them compared to their attitudes previously. But we don't have their attitudes previously, right? So we have to use as a counterpart, as a point of comparison, the people who were not teachers, who did not become teachers, the ones who did not pass the exam. But again, things get complicated quickly. 
because the people who passed the concorso, who got a good enough score to become a teacher, did not automatically become teachers. You only get a job offer. No one forces you to take that job, and you can decline. And actually, rejection rates are quite high. Rejection rates are quite high, I think, because people are also taking other concourses at the same time, and so they may get a better job elsewhere, or may think that they can get a better job elsewhere. In fact, it's a smart thing to do. If I do really well on this concourso, that's a, on this exam, this is a really good signal that I could also do well on another exam. So why not try for another higher, better paying job, right? If it's going to be a permanent job, I want it to be a good one. So people often reject these, these offers. This creates a problem of non-compliance. We treat people, we give them an offer of a job, but then they don't accept. And the problem is the people that don't accept are probably very different from the people who do accept. So that comparison now becomes much more complicated. Another complication is that people accept and then may quit after a year. And that may, self, it may in itself reflect their experiences in the job. Final problem we, we discovered was that, of course, many of the people who fail and do not pass this exam try again in other jobs. And they tend to get jobs quite soon after, right? So if we look at our data, and this is an important graph, so let me explain it. We have the test score, the concorso score that you got on the, on the x-axis here. Okay? And here is the cutoff for where you are offered a job, this straight line here. And on the y-axis, we have um, the probability in our survey that you, are, you ended up being a permanent public sector teacher a few years later. And so obviously, if you did pretty badly on the exam, your chances of getting a job were very low. And we have sort of 0 or 5% chance of getting a job down here. But even for people who failed on our particular concourses, their chance of being employed a few years later as a teacher rises as they get a better score. Right? Obviously, these people are more competent, and they just need another chance, and they'll do better elsewhere. Right? Once we jump over this cutoff, of course, there's a higher average rate of being in the job. But again, we see quite a few people with high scores, really high scores, not accepting. Yeah? This creates a problem of two-sided non-compliance. The people in the control group sometimes get treated as being a public sector teacher, and the people in the treated group of being offered a job sometimes decline and don't end up being a teacher. Maybe they go and do consultancy elsewhere or work in the private sector. So what method can we use to understand the, the complexity of this? Well, we want to use a regression discontinuity because we have a really nice setup here. We have a score, minimum score you need to pass, and we can really compare people either side of that score to understand the effect of being treated. But the problem is it's only the assignment to the job, to being treated, that's as if random at the cutoff. So we also need to take account of the compliance issue. And for this, we, we use tools which have been developed for quite some time, which is called a fuzzy regression discontinuity, which essentially just says that we're going to use um, an instrument, right, another um, variable, to assess whether you have been treated or not. And that variable is whether you were above or below the threshold. So now the discontinuity, like in a normal regression discontinuity, we'd have sort of zero down here, right? No one would be treated here, and everyone would be treated here. And we would estimate the jump from the bottom to the top. Now we're just looking at a probabilistic jump from about a, I uh, can't see very well, about a 35%, 40% chance of having the job to a 65 70% chance of getting the job. The discontinuity we're estimating now is just an increase in probability. Not from zero to one, but from 40 to 70. It doesn't really change that much about our analysis um, <coughs> in, 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 the, in the immediate term. What it does change is our interpretation of our results. So we can still run our analysis, and I'll show you the data now, but the key thing to bear in mind is that all of the evidence that we've been able to gather is for a very specific type of teacher. We only have accurate estimates for what in the literature is called the local average treatment effect. 
the people who, because of our concorso, became public teachers. Those are the compliers, the people who got a job because of our concorso. But we also have another problem, which is that concorsos are very slow processes. Concorsos take a long time, qualified teachers can still be recruited two years later, and people can also endogenously accept or reject, which increases, gives new opportunities for people further down the list to also be hired. So if I reject the job, the next person behind me in line can accept. They have a new opportunity. So that cutoff line I showed you, right, started off somewhere up here. And as all of these people rejected, it kept moving down and down and down until they ran out of, or they got enough people recruited to meet their targets. That means that our cutoff is also endogenous. It's not fixed, right? So we have to estimate where our cutoff also lies. So our estimate is only, excuse me, is only an estimate for people close to this cutoff, and those people tend to be the people who are worst, the, the worst people who were hired, the least performing people who managed to get a job. Not for the really good ones, but for the not so good ones. That's going to turn out to have important consequences because being the last hired makes you quite different from the average, right? The last person hired, one of the things I'll highlight later, has less choice over where they get posted for their job, right? They have less, the first people selected have more influence over the career that they have. The last people have to sort of take the remaining options. Okay. Um, from the data set that we obtained from Sebraspi, we were able to see all of the teacher candidates, but we didn't know anything about their political attitudes. So to measure the outcomes that we wanted to and assess this fuzzy regression discontinuity, we needed to look at a way of capturing their information, of capturing their political attitudes. That was challenging because we wanted to make sure that we had a representative sample, right, in order to get the selection effects measured, but we also wanted to focus on this discontinuity here. <clears throat> and we wanted to make sure we had a balanced representation of people below and above the threshold. And the problem is, when you go to someone and try and do a survey with them, well, if they pass the concorso, they're probably very stable, very well off, very happy, and willing to answer. But someone who did not pass, they might have moved house. They might have gone to another state to look for a job. Their contact details have changed. Maybe they're unemployed and they're quite you know, annoyed with you and don't want to answer your questions there's a risk of differential response rates, differential attrition over the time period we did this survey. This meant that we had to implement a very intensive follow-up process to try and maximize the response rate from as many people as possible. So, we sent four emails, up to four emails until you responded to every candidate. We sent up to four text messages to every candidate until they responded and filled in our survey. We made up to 20 phone calls to try and get them to respond. We are very annoying people, I apologize. <laughs> Persistent, annoying, I'm not sure. Um, and we made, where possible, up to three in-person visits to their house address as well. Right? We could not do that for everyone, and we targeted that to people closest to the threshold where they're most informative and useful. But we tried to get as much response from people as possible. Yeah. Um, on average, it took about three emails or text messages for someone to respond. The majority of our responses are from emails and SMSs. Only 3% are actually in-person responses, but those ones are vital because they're the ones closest to the cutoff. Right? Here is the graph of our response rates. I apologize, this is not so good. Again, on the bottom, we have the concorso score, and here is the cutoff in the middle here. And you can see that the people who were not hired have a much lower response rate on average than the people that were hired. As those of you who've looked at the regression discontinuity method will know, what's really important is that we have a similar rate of response at the threshold, both below and above it. We have a continuity in the response rate, so we don't have a bias in who's responding. Luckily, by focusing so much energy here, we were able to get these response rates very similar 
uh, and at quite high levels, around 75, 80% of people close to that cutoff responded. So yes, there's some people we missed, but this is probably about the maximum you could get, I think, without chasing people for a few years of their lives, which we may still do, but <laughs> okay. Normally when you do this type of natural experiment of regression discontinuity, we look at the balance, right? People above and below that threshold should be very similar. The only difference is in the treatment um, that they subsequently received. And for things like social, uh, social characteristics like gender, race, and age, which don't change, those things should be the same for people above and below the threshold. And so this was one of those moments where you look at your data and you go, okay, thank goodness everything's working out. Well, oh my goodness, what happened? Right? Because race is fine, gender is fine, but we actually see a problem for age. Don't worry about the orange bars for now. Worry about the, the blue ones. It's a little difficult to see, but age here is imbalanced. Older people tended to be more likely to be above the threshold than below. And we scratched our heads and we're like, well, why is this, why is, how is this happening? This should not be happening, right? Of course, it's always statistically possible, but it's still surprising. And so we had to go and find out more about how these concursos work. And it turns out that in the concursos we studied, age was a tiebreaker. Right? So if you had the same score as someone else, the oldest person won. And so this is actually confirmation that this data is working well. It's a problem methodologically, but it meant that we actually really did capture the true process. Because on average, the people who were given a job tended to be slightly older. Which is why it's really good to understand the context and the situation you're working in, rather than just pick up a data set and, and run some tests. I would never have discovered this without talking to people who work in the field and on these, on these concursos. Okay, there are a bunch of regression discontinuity modeling choices which we had to make, which I won't go into detail about, but um, when we use the running variable, right, the score, we could have used the ranking of people. We used the score instead because it's a little bit more precise to capture the, the characteristics of individuals and make them comparable. Um, we just used a linear representation of that regression discontinuity on either side of the threshold. Some people use a nonlinear one, but there are opportunities for manipulation there if you just adapt the, um, the form of the regression to whatever works. So we did the most simple thing possible. We incorporated fixed effects for each of our mini competitions, and we used the standard sort of optimal um, bandwidth for trimming our data in the regression discontinuity. We included controls for age and the date of the survey because those were imbalanced. That may not solve the problem entirely, but it is the best we could do. Uh, and we clustered our standard errors by each value of the running variable to make sure the uncertainty was being captured for the, the form of the regression discontinuity. If you guys have questions about that or we want to discuss more methodological stuff, we can leave that for the Q&A, but I, I want to jump to the results because I'm already um, going over time a little. The hypotheses we had here were in a few different categories. The first one was whether becoming a teacher in a permanent public sector position makes you more middle class, more stable in income, more conservative in your attitudes. What we actually find is that income doesn't change at all. Income tends to be neutral and unaffected by getting this job. This may just be the market working, right? That permanent teachers, temporary teachers, there's a rate that we need to fill a classroom and whether you're in a private, public, temporary, permanent position, that income is unchanged. Yeah. Could be a variety of things. It could be that, yes, your income goes up, but then temporary teachers work multiple jobs to make up the difference to have the same standard of living. We do find that you're less likely to become a homeowner, right, which is against our hypothesis. People are less likely to be homeowners once they've passed these exams. I'll come back to that later. Positions on the left-right scale are unchanged. People are no more right or left wing. But on specific attitudes, we do find some effects. So people tend to be more in favor of higher spending uh, and more critical of the unemployed. These are sort of classic conservative attitudes. So there is some evidence that contrary to that sort of left wing pro redistribution wave of candidates, being in the public sector may make you somewhat more conservative. But it's not you know, a coherent pattern. So I'm not sure how much weight we should, we should put on that. Second hypothesis was about empowerment. Once you get that job, you're empowered to be more um, politically efficacious, more politically informed, more politically active. 
We did find, however, that teachers were no more stable. They were no more likely to expect to be in the same job in five years' time. They had no difference in beliefs to their colleagues, and they were no more likely to hide their beliefs from their colleagues. They did not feel more autonomous and more able to express their own political views. Nor did they feel any more politically powerful, politically influential. None of our indicators of um, whether they have an impact on politics, whether they understand politics, whether leaders care about people like them, suggested any difference. So there are really important ways in which there is no difference once you become a permanent public sector teacher in your political attitudes. Of course, these, effects, these measures may be imprecise, but we actually found less change than we expected. These are more similar to um, private sector and temporary teachers and non-teachers than we had thought. In terms of political activism, again, we see very little difference. They're no more likely to vote, you're no more likely to sign a petition, um, no more likely to strike or be a union member. But interestingly, you are more likely to be a party member and a party supporter. We didn't predict this, hypothesize this in advance, but remember how the candidates that selected into the profession tended to be less involved in party activities even though they were more active generally, probably because they were trying to avoid any impression of political activity in order to get a job. Well, once you have the job, do what you like. So the jump back to compensate for that is that once you have that permanent job, you can be more politically engaged. You can have an affiliation with a party, right? Your job is secure. You have that protection. So I think that's an interesting contrast and finding that we see. Community integration. Are you more integrated in your community for being a permanent uh, contracted teacher in the public sector? We find that teachers are less likely to live in the neighborhood, same neighborhood as their school and their students. They are less likely to have personal relationships with the parents of their students once they get that permanent public sector job. Again, this was a surprise. Why, why is this happening? This is contrary to our hypothesis. And then, as good students do, we remembered what our estimate actually was. It wasn't an estimate for everyone who got that teaching job. It was an estimate for the last hired candidate, that local treatment effect around the cutoff, the people who were hired last, the people who had least choice over their job location and probably got the worst jobs in a not-so-good school in the interior, far away from where they currently live. Right? So unsurprisingly, those people are the least likely to move and be invested in that community. They probably just commute, hoping that they'll be able to get another job in the future in a different location. So again, by understanding the nature of the estimate we have, we're able to interpret our findings a bit better. Um, two more findings and then I'll, I promise I'll be quiet. Um, bureaucratization. This is kind of the, the most expected, I think, and the most mainstream finding that we have, is that teachers care about themselves. Teachers care about their own financial and, uh, interests. They are more likely to be um, pro-increasing um, uh, teacher pensions at the expense of paying for smaller classes or performance pay incentives. These are big policy issues in the sector that are more reformist in nature. If you're not in that permanent public sector position, if you're uh, an average person or a, a private sector teacher or a temporary teacher, you tend to prioritize differently, right? Because that teacher pension is less likely to benefit you in the future because you're more mobile, you're more fragile in your job. On other measures of policy, um, important public policies, such as a national curriculum, hybrid learning, this was during the pandemic, so hybrid learning was a big topic that we thought we would expect to see differences um, depending on your job security and position. We did not. We found surprisingly little policy differentiation. Finally, we expected teachers to become more cynical. And they were. They were more cynical about political institutions. Okay? But surprisingly, they also had a very positive experience in the public sector. They found the public sector, they considered the public sector to be more efficient once they were embedded within it. And even better, they considered the public sector to be less corrupt. I think that probably speaks to people's prior expectations, right? If you're not a public sector worker, 
maybe you expect it, oh, it's a big slush fund where you just take what you want. And actually, when they became public sector teachers, people realized that, no, actually, the system works reasonably well. There's less corruption and, less and more efficiency than we thought. So this went somewhat against our expectations, but I think it can be rationalized. So to conclude, there are two key questions we wanted to look at. How, do, how are teachers' attitudes formed, both at the selection stage of joining the school and the classroom, and then at the socialization stage, once they've entered the, the classroom, how do their attitudes change? We find that teacher candidates are not really representative of the population, and no one really expected that they would be. Right? It's not surprising. Teachers have different ambitions, different values, different attitudes. They're more educated, they're more in favor of redistribution, and they're more politically active except political, in political parties. This is mostly due to self-selection rather than the recruitment process. This is not a bias of the concourse system, it's the preferences and the choices of citizens to, to pursue that career. The second set of effects we look at about socialization, once you join, um, once you become a permanent public sector teacher, compare interestingly with those findings. But we have to remember that these are not full estimates for the entire set of recruited teachers. These are just for a very narrow set of people who um, were compliers, they accepted the job once we were offered in the concorso, and they were the last hired. So their characteristics are quite unusual. On some issues, yes, they are more conservative. There is an offsetting effect, right? The selected candidates are more liberal, the, once you get into the system, you become more conservative, but they're no more empowered. They do become more active in party politics, offsetting that aversion before they join. Surprisingly, they are less integrated into their communities. As expected, they are bureaucratic insiders who show less support for policy reform, right? This is a big issue for, for education policy. The teachers in the classrooms are the most opposed and the most permanent, the most public sector ones are the most opposed. And finally, they're more cynical about politics, but less cynical about the public sector. I would like to tell you sort of a very simple story that integrates all of these findings and gives you a big sort of um, conclusion to this, but since these findings are new, we don't have that yet, and I'd love any thoughts you have about what might explain or contextualize or interpret these somewhat contradictory findings in places. Um, but I do think they're interesting, and I think they tell us a lot about um, two very separate processes which are often mixed together when we want to understand why teachers are, are different from the broader population. Um, thanks very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It was really interesting, all the results and all the data you brought. So I open to the floor. Let's start with some questions. Please, please come to the mic. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It's a really interesting work. Um, throughout, like, watching your presentation, I was always thinking of what role could the parallel private sector be playing on all of this we're seeing? So when we're talking about, you do not expect people to, like the, the processes are very meritocratic, so you do not expect political selection of candidates. This would, this would, not, this would be, lead us to have an expectation, for example, that they would not be different from the general population in terms of political involvement in parties, etc. but you see that they are. But m maybe what could be happening is some relation to the private sector. These teachers, are, these candidates are also applying for private positions that are not as meritocratic, and this kind of positions may uh, danger their chances. Then what I was thinking about is that could be moderated by where are they from? Because you, sh you showed a map of candidates and they're really spread out. And m in many cities, the, op the opportunities you have to apply for a private school are not uh, as relevant as in big capital cities. So uh, I've asked, um, I want to ask you if, you if you've thought of trying to control for the 
the availability of private positions as uh, as something that could be moderating this because if you're from a small city where there's no or very few private schools you may not be concerned of having to be have some certain profile to choose that, that job but if you're in a big city and running for all the positions you can maybe you can differ from other candidates so that's like s ways to think on how the private sector may influence uh, all of the results if you have more questions then you can join them Bruno Bruno then Uh, hi, Jonathan. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the the difference between candidates and actual uh, teachers. Yeah. I don't know uh, if it's if it's good to, to compare them because I think the problem of the the selection. I think the same factors that lead someone to be a candidate. Uh, are the same uh, to become a teacher, and and then uh, I think there is no. Uh, a significant difference uh, or outstanding conclusions comparing these two groups, uh, and also uh, thinking about that. Uh, have you considered uh, a simple selection uh, correction model? Mm. I don't know, something like that. And if it be good, if you find a uh, exogenous instrument to, <laughs> to compare uh, with more certainty, but that's kind of hard. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. The third. Uh, I'm Alexander, uh, uh, a visiting researcher at IRI USPI. Uh, so my question is, uh, I think it's rather close to one that uh, our colleague has al already un asked here. So what about the potential variables that uh, describe the labor market in different uh, circumstances, in different uh, contexts? Uh, I came from Russia and uh, in, uh, in Russia, there are pedagogical universities in almost all big cities. And one of my colleagues, she's a professor at uh, St. Petersburg uh, State Pedagogical University. And uh, once she said ironically, uh, very ironically, she said, we have to teach students as poorly as we can. So when they graduate, they will have never find a good job and they will have to go to work at school. Uh, in Russia, a state is the monopsonist on uh, uh, the education market. So uh, we had uh, an idea to develop this kind of research to see why uh, uh, teachers at schools, uh, they are statist, paternalistic, they are involved in electoral fraud, and they never protest. And one of our predictors, our hy hypothesis, was the bargaining power, because teachers in Russia have the lowest bargaining power on the labor market. So unfortunately, we didn't manage to do this research, but this was one of, one of our hypotheses. So what wh what about your research? Maybe it, it may also work in Brazilian context, especially in different states and in different cities. Thank you. Okay, Jonathan. Awesome, thank you for the questions. Um, challenging to um, give concise responses, but let me try. So. Um, Luis, so firstly, just um, uh, when I was saying that the selection process is not is meritocratic and therefore is not politically biased, I don't think that implies that we shouldn't see political differences, right? I think it means that we should only see them as arising because of the self-selection process that's happening, right? But you're absolutely right that that self-selection process is compared to what alternative, right? I'm only whether I apply to the public sector depends on what the private sector is like, and if it's higher paid and less work and also meritocratic, then great. Maybe there's no real, uh, or the only reason to join the public sector is the pro-social motive, 
right? And so we need to contextualize these hypotheses more relative to their alternatives. Um, I think it's a really interesting idea to look at the labor market and the alternatives that people have available. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't know that we, we, it's necessarily a confounding factor for us with, with the methodology that we have. I'd hope that we'd be you know, relatively robust to that, but I think it would allow us to understand better what types of candidates apply in what circumstances and how that relates to political attitudes. Presumably people in the interior where there are less you know, pedagogical opportunities or private sector um, uh, uh, school op uh, job opportunities um, have different political values and they may be forced into the public sector uh, uh, more so than someone in a city where you have a much more competitive labor market and mo many more opportunities. Um, I would be interested to learn more about how the private sector works. I don't know enough about how that recruitment process works and we have a sort of one-sided story here. So that's, that's a very good comment and I think we need to develop that. Um, uh, what was my other comment? Um, it'll come back to me. Um, Bruno, um, so the idea here is that the candidates and the teachers, the teachers are just a subset of the candidates, right? So the candidates is everyone who applies and then the teachers are the ones that are, that are actually getting the job. It's not, uh, when we're looking at that self-selection, it's really just, you know, um, from the population to the candidates. And then the next step is the recruitment process that compares the candidates and the teachers. And as we see in the results, we don't really see a difference there, right? So it, I agree with you, it's not that surprising, it's not that radical. But I do think it's a good verification that in the process of selecting the best of the candidates, right? Remember we have, was it 76,000, I forget the numbers now, 78,000 candidates, right? The ones that are actually employed in the end are 1,600, right? Maybe a little bit more because they added some positions, but it's, you know, 5% at most of the original pool. It's not obvious to me that when you pick 5% out of a group of people, right, and you're looking for the smartest and the most able, that they're going to be representative of that whole pool in terms of their political values. That seems to be the case here to a significant extent. We haven't gone into the detailed statistical tests yet, but certainly compared to how different the candidate pool is to the population, it's a much smaller difference, right? So whatever it is we're selecting for in the concourse process, it doesn't seem to produce political bias or political differences in, 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 in teachers' values, right? All of that is coming through purely from the people choosing to apply for those jobs. That's not to say that maybe policy-wise we shouldn't do something. Maybe we want to uh, uh, broaden the pool of candidates and give more opportunities um, for other people to apply, right? Or maybe we do want to redress some of that balance by affecting the educate the, the selection process, right? That would be controversial, but it's a possibility. Um, but I think that's, that's more of the line we were going in. Similarly, most of the comparison I was trying to draw out was a really a descriptive one, right? How, is, how do they differ? We weren't, it's a good idea to look at a sample selection model, and I think we'll have to think about that. But our goal here was not really to look at sort of the causal effect, right? And isolate the effect of being a candidate. Um, it was more... Um, to just look at this progression descriptively over those two stages. Yeah, but that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Um, Alexander, yes, uh, I, I already mentioned some comments, but I think it's really interesting to look at the labor market. I don't think that the Brazilian context reflects what you experienced. I think teachers have um, relatively good bargaining power in general. Um, how that compares between public and private sector, I think would be interesting to look at. Again, whether there is an integrated market or whether these are really separate markets, I'm not sure. I think we see a lot of candidates coming from the private sector and going to the private sector. So I do think there's likely to be wage competition. Um, but how strong that is, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, the extent to which that bargaining power on wages in general translate into political activism because of autonomy, because you have a secure wage, versus... Um, for, you know, you're uh, dependent on somebody else for your job and therefore you need to do their political bidding. Um, that's a really good distinction as well. I don't think we see any evidence of the latter. Nothing that we measured was able to pick that up and didn't aim to pick that up. Um, but it may well be happening in some places. Um, we don't look at that. But, but yeah, great comments. Thank you. Um, I think I 
Okay. Yeah. You answered. Okay. Lorena, De Manuel, then Luis, then Okay. <laughs> oh, this is good that this slide is yeah. this is good that this slide is up because this is about my question. So Jonathan, um, very interesting. Uh, interesting also that even though we lost you, we still have you in doing research in Brazil. I hope that this is just to say publicly, please keep doing this work. Um, I'm wondering if you can walk us through a little bit, thinking about that this is a method school and we're thinking about research design and challenges. So looking at this data, ideally I want to test this hypothesis, like you're thinking about the treatment effect is going through the concurso. And you have, you go up, approach this company that is willing to share this data, and you talk to us about these four places, but they're very heterogeneous in terms of the education system, which political parties in charge and running concurso. So if I'm thinking like, you don't have Sera, you don't have the rock star state of good education schools, yep. you have Marañón, you have Distrito <coughs> Federal, right? Then the other thing is finally when you get to the data, you have 1,603 people. So if we think about from what we've been emphasizing in the school, one of the hard things is that's not a very big N for your RDD, right? Because how many people are at the cutoff? In So when you show us the slide, not enough, I'm assuming, to disaggregate by city or by state or yes. So And so I guess what I'm yep. one of the things is I, I think what would be interesting to walk through the students is um, how much planning, if I'm trying to think about this type of a project and doing RDD, how much ex ante I have to do to gauge the data enough to think about what is the size of N that I need to have ideally by the time I get to the cutoff in order to be leveraging the heterogeneity that I get by getting different uh, cases. And then um, also thinking about if you can tell us under the hood a little bit more, how much did you guys really know about we want to do an RDD? Or is the story more we had a really good survey and then we decided to change it to an RDD and then we realized the issue of the N and the cutoff and the challenge. The second thing I thought Luis was going to ask, but I can't help to ask about the pandemic because it seems like you have two treatments, right? Um, what happened to education in Brazil during the pandemic is part of, when you're asking people and the teachers to tell you about their experience, it's also about their experience during COVID. So I'm in wondering how much data do you have about that? Mm -hmm. And if there's a way that you're able to separate and tease that out more, so it's about teaching pre-COVID or teaching during, teaching pre-COVID versus teaching during COVID if the if those these these statistical differences that you're observing, if they're significantly different than zero, okay. You don't know your own strengths. You can use this. <laughs> Hopefully nothing. <laughs> um, great talk, Jonathan. Um, very interested, interesting. Um, <coughs> I have so many questions, but I only ask a couple of questions. Um, so about the the local average treatment effect. Um, I don't think I, I, I understood, uh, maybe because I'm not very familiar with FUS RDD, more used to um, sharp RDD, so maybe you can walk through a little bit. But my question is, you have uh, the compliers, okay, um, and the no compliers you have um, <coughs> defiers, right? So. They are assigned a treatment, and they don't they they don't accept it, right? Because uh, they you have a subgroup subpopulation of people who are offered a job and they don't don't take, and you know, for that subgroup they are the first, not for the for the others because if they are not offered a job they can't 
take, I, I suppose, uh, I mean, they can take in another concourse. So I, I'd like for you to, because the local average tre treatment effect is for compliers, right? So, uh, but you have this complication, I would like to hear more about it. Um, so that's, that's one question. Um, the other question is more generally, <coughs> why not two papers, right? Because you have one research question related to the, why they apply to the job and the other, uh, what's the effect of the socialization, right? And it seems that you have a lot of things going on, right? So I'd like to hear you, uh, if you have discussed, then especially because for the students, right, it's something that sometimes they struggle and even we struggle as well. Right? I, do I have two papers here or just one single paper? So I think uh, we would benefit to hear about how you decide these kind of things. Uh, of course, a single paper will be uh, uh, more complete, etc. but it makes the story complicated, especially because uh, they you have so many questions and data, etc. Thank you. Uh, Luis. Uh, good evening, Professor Jonathan. Always great to have you back here. And thank you for your presentation. My question will be uh, lighter than the previous two, but when looking at your interpretation for the apparent effect of professors uh, that were accepted into the job uh, being more likely to have uh, negative effects regar uh, regarding uh, unemployed people, couldn't it be that it's actually an effect of people that have remained unemployed among the control group making that the they have a different experience from the one that would be expected as if they, they remained as before they not being selected. So the general question is, is there also uh, some kind of socialization among the people that weren't selected uh, for the job? So that's it, thank you. Great, thank you. Maybe if I may, if I, do you want to take Edu's now? Or we can go another round still. Uh, uh, let's go. Let's, okay. let's take this round. Um, maybe if I can take Luis's question now because it's fresh in my head and I won't forget. Um, yeah. So um, all of our estimates here, as always, are just the difference between the treatment and the control group. I can't really tell you how much of this is due to being treated versus being in the control. Right? It might be that the treatment has no effect, but the rest of the world moved on, right? And everyone else is changing. Um, that could possibly be true, I think. But I think maybe the, the, the more important part of your question is, what does it mean to take a concorso and fail or not be selected for that particular concorso? Um, and in our case, it's even more complicated because it is very important for some teachers that they can report that they qualified for a previous concorso, even if they did not get hired, right? You have a certificate to say, I qualified. That is a great signal for getting the next job. Right? So there are some complications here we, we still need to think through about how you're doing one concourse or whether you pass, qualify or fail changes your future prospects. But also maybe your self-confidence. Right? Um, we are actually able, we haven't done the analysis at all yet, um, to look at the effect of being qualified. Right? Because there's another threshold for being qualified. And so we actually put in our, in our pre-analysis plan that we would study the question of compared to not passing at all, what happens when you get qualified but don't get a job. And I think that's really interesting because it will actually speak more to the sort of the psychological side of things rather than to the bureaucratic institutional insertion into the state side of things. Um, but what the results will be, I have no idea. Um, just because you guys emphasize some of the practical things, one of the practical constraints there in working with this data is that we're only able to do this analysis in a secure cold room in Brasilia, in Inepi's headquarters, right? And unfortunately now none of us are based in Brazil. So that very much restricts how much analysis we can do and you're only allowed to bring out three sets of results from your data set. So um, doing the analysis is actually much harder for us than collecting the data in a way, which is very frustrating. But um, uh, we will 
these, these suggestions are really helpful because we need the sort of the full set of what we need to do now so that we can get it done. Comments in six months' time are no use. So <laughs> we can't do anything about it. So thank you so much. Um, Lorena, um, yeah, lots here. So heterogeneity of the places and studied here. A comment, my response to most of your comments is that this was very opportunistic, right, um, in, in, a, in a real sense that we spent a long time trying to find a partner who could share their data with us, and we went to various governments and concourse organizations, and so what we ended up with was everything that we could get from this organization that was willing to partner, um, and maybe that's the good lesson, is persistence and opportunism, right? You'll find something interesting to study, um, have a question in mind, have a focus, but you've just got to run around until you find some data. Um, so we had no idea in advance whether we would have sufficient power to run these studies. Most importantly, precisely because of these compliance problems, the statistical power we have is much, much lower than if there was full compliance, right? Much of the power is actually not that bad because while we have a little over 1,600 treated candidates, we have a huge number of control candidates. So we actually have a reasonable set to compare with. Um, how much of those are close to the threshold? Well, again, I don't know how to answer that specifically because there's no, at the threshold, there's very few people. Close to the threshold, there's quite a few. And the power of a regression discontinuity design doesn't just come from the people near the threshold. It also comes from the people further away that help us estimate the trajectory of that, that line where it hits the threshold. So I think the statistical power is, is low here, but it is sufficient for us to reach some conclusions. But I'm, I'm in no doubt that some of our null findings are because we really need more data. It's a very demanding methodology. Um, so that's very much the case. Um, while I say it was opportunistic, we did go into this knowing that we would run a regression discontinuity. Um, the discussion that, that, that the team had, and the team is mostly education specialists, and, and, and I came in um, after the fact as a political scientist who studies Brazil, um, but it was very much focused on understanding the teacher's experience in Brazil, in education. Um, and how being a teacher changes you. That was always the objective, and we knew that the concourse system was relatively meritocratic and would be a good opportunity to run that regression discontinuity. The problem is just finding the data um, and finding an opportunity to have good data to answer that question with. And that's why I say I think um, this original project started, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, right? It's a long, long process. Part of that is, is getting the data, part of it is the pandemic, but it's a, it's a, it's a long process. So <laughs> that's not to discourage people, but just to say that it's, it's complicated. Um, regarding the pandemic, I don't have a great answer. We, oh, sorry, I didn't really answer your question about heterogeneity of places either, sorry. Um, so the four places we studied were the ones that happened to be available. Um, I actually think it's good that they're heterogeneous. It means our findings are a bit more generalizable to a broader range of places. Distrito Federal is very different to São Luís, for example, right? But um, it does bring risks. Maybe we've got offsetting effects in very different places. The concursos are run in a very standardized way, um, but the education systems, the labor markets may differ. Um, so we need to try and do that heterogeneity test. Whether we have enough power to do that, I think, again, is probably not the case for somewhere like Sao Cristobal and Sergipe, where we have much less power, mm -hmm. but Distrito Federal versus Maranhão, maybe. So we can try and look at it, but it's, it's a great suggestion, but as of now, we don't, we don't know. Um, for the pandemic, um, we, <coughs> um, we did not ask people questions about when they taught or how they taught. For the very practical reason, that we needed to keep the survey as short as possible. Remember, 84% of people responded to an online survey, and the more questions you put, the lower your response rate. So we kept our survey very short, as short as we could. And that meant a lot of this detail and a lot of those nice hypotheses have to be ignored. Um, the good part is that we are able to match these teachers to INEPI's database in the cold room in Brasilia, of teachers, so we know which school they taught at in which year, or if they did not teach, and we can run those analyses ex post, right? And we can, and one of the things we want to look at, for example, is heterogeneity of school quality. So if you're posted to a really good school, is your experience more positive and your trust in the state higher than if you're sent to a really bad school, for example? Um, and similarly, geographical variation, gender variation, things like this. So I think there's more we can do, um, but in terms of experiences during the pandemic, it might be limited. 
uh, Manuel, um, yeah, so the local average treatment effect here is, it's, it's two things, right? And it's coming from the fact that our threshold is um, endogenous and coming down the spectrum. And so we're really only getting the last few candidates who were hired at the end of that threshold, right? And so as with a normal regression discontinuity, this is the close elections equivalent is the last people hired. What's different here is that being the last person hired gives you different rights and a different type of treatment. So it's kind of worse in a way, right? It's not just that the context is different, it's that the treatment is a little bit different. And we don't have a great solution to that. That's just intrinsically what we are estimating. I think it might mean that we want to compare that to more observational comparisons of the broader data set to see how the sort of the best performing people actually, if that we get the same effects or not. Um, unless I'm mistaken, I don't think we, well, again, we don't know if we have defiers, right? We don't know who is a complier. But in this case, I don't think defiers are really the problem. Um, what we have is people who might never accept the treatment um, because they already are going to run for a different concourse. So whether they get the job or not, they won't accept. And we might have always takers, which is, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to accept the job if I get it. But even if I don't, I'm really good and I'm going to have a con run a con concourse, concourse elsewhere and get that job instead, right? So defiers, people who sort of, um, uh, get the job because they fail our specific concourse. I don't know that that's likely to happen. That would be sort of a violation of meritocratic rules. Um, possible, but we don't have any evidence of it. Um, but a good thing to think about as a, as a check on robustness, very much so. In terms of number of papers, um, uh, the Yes, we would like to do a number of papers from this data because we think it's quite rich and can speak to a lot of different questions. This is not a paper, this is just a presentation of preliminary data, and so trying to make the connections here is me sort of forcing the issue a little bit. There are certainly comparisons to be made, right? I think a lot of these direct, the offsetting effects and the compensatory effects in terms of, um, you know, more liberal versus more conservative once you join the job, avoiding political parties versus joining them when you enter the job, I think that is part of a bigger theoretical framework um, that it would be difficult to understand why people start to join political parties more without understanding why they avoided them before they joined the profession. So I think these things speak to each other and is a broader theoretical framework, but you're also right, there's too much for a single paper, so maybe we need to separate things out. And we'd always plan to do selection and socialization separately. Um, so I think two papers, um, but if you have suggestions, we'd also be, be very happy to hear them. Uh, did I miss anything? No. It's okay? It's okay. We do. Thank you. These are really great and helpful questions. We do. Let's try not to ruin the microphone. <laughs> well, uh, thanks a lot, Jonathan. Uh, I was uh, wondering about... Um, I think the, the the exercise is really interesting and 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 powerful, but uh, there's no policy on it until now, at least. And I believe uh, policies, uh, the difference in uh, policy may uh, present some refinement of uh, including uh, uh, considering the the heterogeneity of the cases, because you have two municipalities. You have two states, and one of these states is odd, which is Brasilia, which is uh, the Distrito Federal. And uh, w why this is important? Because the levels of, uh, uh, of salaries tend to be very different. And also, the, the, the networks of schools that each of these um, <coughs> educational policies uh, sustain or deliver locally. And it's different con considering the, the, the questions about the market uh, considering that uh, people are choosing to become um, uh, 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 school teacher and not, um, I don't know, uh, uh, go to the uh, stay there as a, I don't know, uh, in the supermarket, uh, in a cashier at the supermarket. This depends on the level of schooling that the the, the persons are, are being selected for, and for the municipalities, you are probably talking about people who have very uh, low um, uh, levels of, of uh, specialization in terms of, of degree. So they have 
some kind of uh, professional course, um, high school uh, diploma, uh, specialized in, in education, for example, uh, which is, was called in Brazil normal a long time ago. So uh, these, these uh, individuals could be the market, the other market, the butter and margarine of these, for, for these individuals would be the cashier of the supermarket. While the person who went to the university and, I don't know, is, has a degree on chemistry or uh, geography to become a, uh, a high school teacher, this guy, uh, the, the market is the private, private school which can pay more or less. So there are several different markets there which are heterogeneous considering the levels of education that each of the cases, the four cases involve. And I think this could be uh, important to disentangle a little bit the results. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, congratulations on the, the work. I was wondering, uh, could we check again the slide with the? It has like religion associations. Had like all the from the, Which char one, the characteristics of the candidates. I'm just like, ah, like yeah, yeah. yeah, the colorful balls to one. Uh, that one, yes. Uh, yeah, teachers are slightly higher in the members of religious association. Not too much from the general population, but a bit higher. I was wondering, did you guys check the about religious values as part of the research, or are you interested in checking it later? I was wondering if it, it can inf it can influence on the on the selection process because we had like a issues with the Conselho Tutelar in Brazil. I'm trying to figure out how to translate it because like religious people were very interested in working in certain areas that relates to childcare that can be a space of proselytization, a place to actually think like preach about religion. Maybe it can affect the school system as well, and maybe so it's a maybe it's a motivator. It may influence the comp the behavior and the beliefs of the teachers as well. So it c if it's an interesting association, maybe to further work. Thank you. So then, so as others have said, this is amazing, amazing data, lots to do. Um, my question follows up on your response to Luis. I want to know if your survey can tell us about who the control group is. And in particular, right now, compliers for you are permanent public sector teachers, and yet the story is about being a teacher and educator. And I'm curious how much of the effects you're picking up are about permanence or publicness as opposed to being an educator, and whether the control group are educators but just in different jobs. Um, so some of that's descriptive, but I think part of it is also a, since you're going to go back, um, if you can look at heterogeneous effects by primary versus secondary education or other dimensions of the concurso, where you might expect the education effect to be a bit stronger relative to, say, the permanence or the publicness of the job. Okay. Here we go. Uh, okay, uh, I thought the questions would get easier, but they got harder. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, Edu. Um, yeah, I agree with everything you've said. Um, we haven't really thought through policy. The, the 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 policy implications we thought we might have were really related to sort of the education policy preferences of teachers about how they felt about particular reforms and particular education controversies. We don't see much action there, right? We see the sort of classic. Yeah, we care about ourselves, we're not gonna you know, have smaller classrooms, we want a bigger pension. Okay, that's not super surprising or interesting. So um, I do think we need to pivot and have a, a more direct sort of policy uh, implication and understanding of the policy context in which we're operating and, and how, we, how any of this speaks to the design of the system as a, as a broader whole. Um, I don't have much specifics on that because I don't know that system, I'm not an expert on it. But I think you're right, we need to, to look at it and more challenging still is that looking at these individual state and municipal education systems and how they differ is, uh, is a huge task. Um, we actually had an USP student help us to write uh, narrative histories about all of these locations to help us understand the political context. And it was super interesting and the role of the unions, for example, is, is very clear in some and very absent in others. Um, 
but we haven't used that qualitative information to really inform and contextualize what we're saying here, um, and we need to do that. That's, that's absolutely correct, particularly for the Distrito Federal, which is, which is very different. I guess I don't know um, off the top of my head whether the, the overall higher salary level in the Distrito Federal also comes with a differential relationship between teachers being more or less higher in the income hierarchy than they would be in Sergipe, for example. I don't know what the relative differences are, and I think that's what would mainly matter for us, um, but we need to explore that um, more. All three questions, I think, or all two, Edu and Soleil's questions, all speak to um, this question of the control group, and I also, that was the thing I forgot to say to Luis's question as well. Um, the key um, analysis we have yet to do is to break down these comparisons into permanent versus temporary, private versus public, teacher versus not teacher. At the moment, we're lumping together that control group, all of these different profiles. Um, partly that's because, again, the accurate data we have on that comes from merging our data with that from INEPI uh, and from the HEIS data set, which is something we can only do in Brasilia and is very difficult and time consuming and challenging. Um, and so we haven't had the opportunity to do that, but I think that will give us a much stronger handle on, on some of your questions um, about you know, um, the type of skills and the type of competition and the type of salary differential and how that creates more or less selection in some concursos than in others uh, and in some locations than in others. Um, so that's really helpful, thank you. Um, yeah, so the question about um, religious values is another one of those things that falls into the category of we would really like to ask about it, but the survey was really short. Um, I think there are a bunch of issues which motivate teachers to, to, uh, to explore a career in teaching which we're not capturing very well. And some of them are sort of very basic social things about like whether you are very, uh, you know, um, introvert or extrovert when interacting with children, for example. Others are more politically relevant social values such as religious beliefs, which um, I hadn't thought of the expectation, the sort of suggestion you made that that might drive you to be in schools to sort of socialize or proselytize to the children. I was thinking of that more as a, a reason not to, not to join because you had other priorities or something. Um, but that's very interesting and very uh, important to explore. I don't think we have a measure of it directly, but we do have, you know, whether they participate in a religious organization, which is at least a, a minimal measure of um, religious beliefs. And it would be good, I think, to understand who that is, whether it's different in different regions, and, um, and, and even whether that um, changes once you're, once you're occupied with a full-time job. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I totally agree we need to look at the, the comparisons to the control group. We don't have a good handle on that. It's an example I literally gave yesterday in class, right? What is the control group? Um, and I've not managed to follow that through in my own research, so um, I need to do that. Um, interesting suggestion to look at heterogeneity by primary and secondary school. Um, and, and just so I understand, the difference is that because in secondary school the, um, the skill level is likely to be higher, the comparison point is more likely to be other teachers. You're more likely to be, if you're more specialized, you're more likely to be comparing with private school teachers um, rather than for a primary school job where it's less qualified, there's more of an alternative market and therefore we might be comparing more with non-teachers. Is that what you mean? That might be it. I was also thinking of the socialization experience which might look very different yeah, yeah. depending on what you're teaching. Um, yeah. Okay, like more of a socialization effect, I see, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it also, they are very different settings, right? So a primary school is often a very small establishment with you know, half a dozen other teachers, whereas a secondary school can be dozens of teachers which may have a more diverse political background, they may be older, they may have you know, certain baggage that comes with that. And so the sort of organizational norms that I talked about at the start might well be quite different in a secondary school. Um, so that's a really interesting suggestion. Um, I think I answered most of it. Um, yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Another question? No. Jonathan, let me just ask one thing. Mm. If you don't. <laughs> um, I just I just want to know about the the time of the treatment, because for instance, for most of the things that you're saying, it takes time to happen. Yeah. 
And uh, the concursos are in different dates, and then you apply a survey probably in the same time, and then we have different ranges of time. They, they were exposed to the treatment in different manners. How, how do you face it? How do you deal with it? That, that, that's all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> As with most of my answers is you don't, right? You just yeah. present some results and wave <laughs> your hands. Um, <laughs> Or you don't yet, at least. Yeah. So we, are, we always plan to look at the duration of treatment as a continuous variable rather than as a binary variable. Okay. Um, it's a little bit more complicated in the regression discontinuity framework, right? Uh, because we're usually dealing yeah. with a binary treatment or not treatment. Yeah. So we have to be a little bit uh, more sophisticated in our analysis to do that. But again, it also requires us to um, understand when and where they were employed, which requires a lot of data work in the background, which we've yet to do. But you're right, I think there's two factors actually. One is the time of treatment, right? So in what, in what sort of period of global history were you first employed? Um, and this comes down to the pandemic again, right? Like your experience in the first few months of the pandemic, if you became a teacher in Sao Cristobal, for example, is going to be very different from back in 2015 in Distrito Federal. Yeah. That, that, that's a very different moment in history. But then there's also the question of duration, clearly, There'll be some teachers in Distrito Federal who have now been there for eight, nine years, whereas in Sergipe it's a maximum of four or five. Um, we have the data on how long they've been there and what the duration of their treatment is, um, but we need to calculate it and we need to find a way to integrate it. But I think um, what everyone is sort of pointing to here is that the nature of the treatment is not as uniform as we're suggesting, mm -hmm. right? Being a permanent public sector teacher means very different things in different places, at different points in time, for different durations, in different types of school, um, which all points to the need to disaggregate and look at the nuances, um, which raises the question of do we have the statistical power to do that, um, yeah. which I think yeah. we'll find out. <laughs> yeah. okay. But thank you. Okay. Anybody else? So, Jonathan, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really thoughtful. I think we learned a lot. Um, I think it was quite useful for everyone here to see how we deal with a big data set, and how, what's the challenges we face, and how hard we have to work until we publish a book or a paper or whatever. So thank you very much for your presentation. And I see you're extremely tired, but tomorrow we have more. We're ending up. <laughs> We're close to the end. <laughs> Let's keep up. Okay, see you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.